have you back and to share today. And, and, and in this particular session, um, I think we can, we can reach a, a point of each one of us having to sit back and say, hey, wait a minute here, is this it? Something has happened this week, which is awesome. And um, you know, I've used this word several times uh, to describe my feelings about it, and you'll have to see um, how you feel. But last week, <coughs> we reached a point of opening the third seal. But prior to that, we had developed some very interesting points about the crucifixion, uh, namely that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is both an anatomical phenomenon, meaning it happens within the body, and an astronomical phenomena. It happens in the sky. Um, actually, uh, at the time when all of this came down, this material was written by the Greek mythologists of the time. I mean, if they were not involved, then someone could speak to me and say, well, no, this was a little... This was written by the Greek mythologist who used the time that the sun passed through the constellation, the Southern Cross, which was the shortest day of the year, as the crucifixion of the Son of God. Just a few months after it was born out of the constellation Virgo, the Virgin. Well, that's one crucifixion, the sun on December 21st going through the cross. And just think of the implications of that. If the sun does not pass through the cross, then it could not rise to sit in the eastern sky or the right side on June 21st and bring you summer. You cannot have the new life in the spring unless the sun came down to the earth in the solstice and passed through the cross. That's the crucifixion. But what happened then is your families and my families all became inheritors of information that came from a point in history called the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages of Europe. It was a time when religions actually controlled everything. Religion was the government, not unlike what goes on in some places today, like Iran and Afghanistan is a perfect example where a woman is not allowed to go outside of her house unless she has written permission from her husband and all this stuff. This is what goes on in places that are controlled by religion. Well, the religion that your parents followed was actually the parent of that many years ago in the Middle Ages of Europe. And all of this superstition and all of this literalism of mythology came forward as a way of controlling families and controlling you. Up to this very day, they use that. And so the sun passing through a constellation, which is an astronomical phenomena, talked to us by people who were totally aware of the work of the universe, the Greeks, turned into being a literal story of a, of a man who was actually God's son born out of a virgin who had to be nailed up on this cross so that this heavenly father who loves you so much could forgive. I, I mean, as a little child, I, I could not conceive of why there had to be blood and torture and mayhem for somebody named God to forgive people. Just the simple act of kindness and forgiveness was incapable of this God unless there was this brutality. Well. As I grew older, I started to realize that maybe a lot of the anguish that we're seeing on the earth is because of the blasphemy which we've created against God by saying this thing is impossible, is incapable of forgiveness without bloodshed. So not only then was the story written about the sun that goes through the constellation, the Southern Cross, so that it can rise up into the newness of spring, it was written about the solar plexus energy inside of your body, which must rise up to the pineal gland and then head over to the right hemisphere of the brain so that you pass over from the winter of your soul to the newness of the spring. Now, in understanding this, we have arrived at solving one of the most critical points in religion, 
as both an astronomical fact and an anatomical fact of great importance. Jesus is really the sun in the sky that must pass through the cross if there is to be new life. And the energy in you, which is the solar plexus energy, which must rise up to the point of the crucifixion if there is to be new life in you. The interesting thing that we found last week was that the Bible written by the Greeks who wrote in these great symbols is very clear. They didn't really hide it that hard for you to understand. They have Jesus crucified in Golgotha, and the word Golgotha means skull. They have the crucifixion taking place in Mount Calvary, and the word Mount Calvary, Calvary is a translation of the Latin Calvaria, which means skull. I'm going to give you something interesting today uh, that you will be able to take with you, and it's from Stedman's Medical Dictionary, and it says Calvaria, the upper dome-like portion of the skull. That's where the crucifixion takes place. Mount Calvary, here is where it occurs. In Golgotha, the skull, here is where it occurs. Okay. I mean, they weren't even trying to hide it. The other interesting thing is that Calvaria is a Latin translation of the Greek word, which is cranian, from which the English word comes cranium, the skull. This is where your crucifixion takes place. And so then we find out that what must happen is that the solar, which is the sun energy or the Jesus energy in you, must move itself up to the hill, up to Mount Calvary, up to the place of the skull, so the crucifixion can take place and salvation can then come to the earth. So, there's another part of this that's interesting, too, in that you'll see in the, in the Bible it says Jesus is the testator. And as the testator, he is then subject to death so that you can have an inheritance. Well, you'll look at the material that I gave you, and you'll see that the word testa means skull. This is in the material I gave you that you have. Uh, you're going to receive this today, that Calvary is Calvaria, which is cranium. This is all the skull. But the entire Bible is extremely clear. Why was it Mount Calvary? It's the skull. It's your head. Why is it Golgotha? It's your head. Why is he the testator? It is your head. See, all of this stuff is your head. And if, and if you look, you know, sometimes it's, if you look on page 57 of the material that you were given, and you go down to the middle of the page. It says, Matthew 27, 33, when they were coming to a place called Golgotha. That is to say, a place of the skull. That's your head. And then if you go down a little below that, it says, and the crucifixion took place on Calvary. And you see it says, Calvary, Calvaria, skull. And it tells you the Latin Calvaria, skull, from which comes Calvary, is a translation of the Greek cranium, which is cranium. Head, specifically the part that encloses the brain, the brain case. That's where the crucifixion takes place. Okay. But in order for the systems and the religions of the world to control you, they made a literal story out of this myth and then portrayed a god, a creator of the universe, incapable of forgiveness unless blood flows. And of course, it says in the Bible, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Well, so then, by the way, see that proves it. That proves it. It doesn't prove it because this is what it means. Blood is the inner life force, and you shed the inner life force so that you are no longer controlled by sin, which is the emotions. And how do you shed the inner life force? By separating from the thoughts of the mind in meditation. And you do that in your bathroom by turning the lights out and holding your breath for 10 seconds, and it's over. It's a big deal. But oh no. These things are turned into great parades and rituals, and people get dressed up in funny costumes and march through the streets and all of this stuff, and everybody follows them because we're totally consumed in the emotional nature. And when we consume ourselves in following these religious organizations, we miss nature, we miss the universe, we miss the cosmos. 
Okay. Now, as I told you today, you'll receive number 101 to put in your uh, stuff. And in 101, at the very top of the page, you'll see from Stedman's Medical Dictionary, Calvaria being a translation for Calvary, which is the skull. And you'll see Cranium being a translation that says right here, Medieval Latin from the Greek Cranium. It's your head. Okay. So this sacrifice of the Son of God, which is the key to salvation, is actually acted out in the sky. The sun comes down to the earth at the time of the winter solstice, which is the darkest time of the year, and you're coming, you'll be coming to that soon again. And then it passes through the constellation Southern Cross, it's crucified. After it goes through the Southern Cross on December 21st, which is the shortest day of the year, it sits in the tomb of the earth for three days and three nights. It's called the winter solstice. It's December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And while the sun is entombed in the earth, we are all piously running around to Walmart buying stuff for people. Because on December 25th, by the trajectory of the earth, God's sun is reborn. That's what happened. That's what it's all about. See. But in your body, what happens is the sun which has come down into you to give you life, which is the solar plexus energy, must rise up to Mount Calvary where the crucifixion can take place. And when the crucifixion takes place, then the sun can rise to sit at the right hand or the right hemisphere of the brain and you pass over. In the same way, the sun goes through the cross and rises up. It is Leo, the pineal, the domicile of the sun is Leo, the lion. And when the lion rises up in the springtime, it envelops the lamb, which is Aries. The lion lays down with the lamb, and you pass over from winter to spring. Then flowers come out. That's what it is. That's what it is. Now, if we can only understand this, in line with what we are seeing in the sky now, and if we can only take, actually take part in this crucifixion with Christ, which was the anointing, then we'll know, and then we will find this peace, and then we will flow in harmony. And when I show you what I'm about to show you today, which is so spectacularly awesome, that I think maybe at this point you'll be convinced that it is time for you to act. Okay? Jesus being 888 in the, in the Greek translation, is the sun, the fire. Okay? I like the blue better. For Christ is the anointing. That's what the word means. This is the solar plexus. The solar plexus energy rises up to your head. Before it gets to your head, it hits at the top of the spine something called the hypoglossal nerve. At the hypoglossal nerve is another organ called the olive. When the energy moves through the spinal fluid, the electrical energy moves through the spinal fluid, it rises up, impacts the olive, and anoints you with olive oil. That's the Christ. It is the sun, which is Jesus, which is fire energy, which hits the olive and anoints you. So there is Jesus Christ, the sun and the olive, the sun the energy, the fire, and the anointing. But that happens in your body. Now what's interesting is that this eye in the sky, which is now on fire, is about ready to anoint the earth. See, understand something. First of all, the crucifixion is God's will. Now, we, we really have to be barbaric. I mean, your religion, my religion that I was raised with, is a little bit like, did you ever see King Kong? <laughs> it's what it is. It's King Kong with a white sheet. Because what it says is, in order to forgive you, we have to bring a human sacrifice. In order for there to be peace on the earth, God has to have a human sacrifice. So they take this poor guy up and hang him on this tree, and now everything's going to be fine. This is bizarre. And it's not only bizarre from the standpoint that we believe this stuff, but by the millions. This is, this is, our, this is the whole foundation of our, of our lifetime. 
Crucifixion is a wonderful thing because it means that when you rise to the skull, you then subdue the five senses. Those are the five wounds that Jesus takes, hands, feet, and sight. You subdue the five senses in, in, in the meditation, which is sight, taste, touch, smell, hearing. You subdue it for just a few moments. That's crucifixion takes place. Then you can move up into higher realms because you separated from all of the physical senses. If you frustrate that, see, it wasn't those who crucified Jesus who were bad in the Bible. They were the good guys. They were the good guys. This was, Jesus said, this is the will of my Father. That means when they do this, this is God's will. So don't frustrate it. There was one guy who tried to frustrate it. You remember Peter come up to Jesus and said, this is not going to happen to you. What did Jesus say in the Bible? Get behind me, Satan. Satan. In other words, anybody who tries to stop this is Satan. Let me ask you, who tries to stop you from meditating inside of yourself and rising to a higher realm of consciousness? Who tries to do it? Me. Not yourself. The system out there. Well, yourself is true, but the system out there. And it's known as religion. If there's one thing they don't want you to do is enter within yourself, and this is where we take our kids for Sunday school. Well, you got to learn. Is there any wonder? We have raised kids, you know, when they shoot each other and all these wild things happen. Why not? Look at what we've taught them. I, this is what happened to me when I was a little kid. And I've told you this story, and I won't go into details of it, but I came out of a house which was like the gunfight at the OK Corral. Our house was a rough place. You better, you better know which, where to hide and how to duck if you wanted to get out because there was knives, flew, there was knives flew around that house. Bannisters, bloke, people came to, it was like the OK Corral. I mean, it was really nasty. And I'd just come in, I'd hear the screaming, and I'd hear things flying and things hitting the wall. I'd just turn around and head out the door. And, hey. But they took me to church, a little kid. And I sat there, and I looked up, and there's a guy hanging on this thing with blood coming out of him. I said, who did that? <laughs> His father. I said, this guy's worse than when I got home. I ain't going to go home. Right, eh? Is he crazy? And I never, you know, I was never comfortable. To this day, I can't walk in those places. I can't, I want to walk in and see flowers and puppy dogs and, and nice little things. I don't want to walk in and see this. But, you know, what a negative thing, and you put this in front of people. And what is it? You are, you, you are displaying in literal form the sun, the light of the world, moving through a constellation in the universe. How sick we are. And so, those who will frustrate you from experiencing what the he Hindus call Kundalini are Satan. I would say, well, well, they're not into Kundalini. Then forget Kundalini. How about Revelation 5.1, which is the book of life. And I saw in the right hand, which is the right hemisphere of the brain, of him who sat on the throne, which is Calvary, which is the higher consciousness, a book, which is the book of life, written within, within you, and on the backside of your spine, sealed with seven seals. It's in the Christian Bible. And they can't see it. They don't understand it. So think of the implications. But here's the point. And why you have to meditate and why I'm t trying to give you every easy, I'm trying to tell you. I have no problem with people who teach meditation for healing or people who teach meditation to try to help people solve their you know, physical problems and emotional problems. But I do have problems with you going to be taught meditation to make contact with God because nobody can teach you that. Don't let anybody, because all you need is 10 seconds. Get into a dark room, hold your breath, 10 seconds and leave. That's it. It's all you need. I'm not saying you have to come here, you have to go anywhere, Just you, but you have to pay attention to yourself and you have to do this. And I'll tell you why you have to do it. In the Bible, in Matthew 27, 32, on page 806, it says, as they came out, meaning the people who were going to crucify Jesus, they found a man of Cyrene, Cyrene, Simon, and they compelled him to bear the cross. And when they were come onto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of the skull. Understand what you're seeing here. Jesus is the sun energy and the energy inside of your solar plexus. It will not go up. It cannot rise up until the skull unless you make it happen. Unless you carry the cross, it's not going to go. Unless you do the meditation, it's not going to move. 
The solar plexus energy, which winds its way in this kundalini fashion through the spine upward to the pineal gland, will not go unless you make it go. It can't go by itself. That's what this story of the guy carrying the cross. If you do not do the meditation to raise the energy, Christ will not be crucified and the salvation in your life will not occur. So that's it. There's no other way you can do it. You can study. You can go to meetings. You can read New Age books. You can read Old Age books. You can do all of this stuff. If you do not do the meditation, it won't move. So you have your choice. Now, that, you probably say, oh, you, you don't have to go to any meditation meetings. You don't have to go to any meditation places. Go to the bathroom. Most of you happen to go in there once in a while. So go to the bathroom. Shut the light out and let it happen. Ten seconds. Doesn't cost anything. Won't work any other way. Simon, who carried the cross, is from the word Simeon, which means hearing. Those who have heard are the ones who are compelled to carry the cross. I also like the fact that it's from Cyrene. Cyrene is a city on the African coast that is now called Tripoli. But what's interesting, it, at the time that this was written, it was a Greek colony. So I think they kind of slipped in where, where all of this information came from, you know, who was authoring this. So in the Bible story, too, they, they offered Jesus vinegar and gall to drink, which was a narcotic to deaden the pain. And it was refused. And this is simply a symbol of the action that the systems and religion will provide to deceive you and to lull you to sleep with all kinds of different religious activities. Refuse it. Don't have any part of it. Hey, all you've got to do is say this, sign this card, and you're going to go to heaven. Come down the aisle, bow your heads, don't everybody looking around, raise your hands, say this, and everything's going to happen. No, it's not. But it's going to deceive you. It's going to lull you to sleep in thinking that all of these wonderful things are going to happen. Name it, claim it, you'll receive it. No, you won't. Oh, if you happen to get better, you're going to come down and say, God healed me. But if you happen to get worse, you're not going to say anything. They won't let you. And so you have to come to grips with the fact that just as the story says, refuse the narcotic, refuse that which tries to lull you to sleep into this false sense of saying, everything's going to be fine if I just sit here and I'm going to fly off to heaven. You're not going to fly off anywhere. You're going to go into a box with paper in your mouth. And everybody's going to come and see you and say, gee, he looks better than he did when he was off. And then somebody will come out after, after they get rid of you and they bring you in a car and they put you in, in the ground. Somebody will come around to everybody at the car. Do you want to come over to the house? Yeah. No, but that's the best part. <laughs> I've been waiting through this whole thing to get over to the house, have some ziti. Because they always have ziti at these things. <laughs> so we, we refuse that. We, we know the crucifixion must take place. We know how the crucifixion must take place. The energy must rise up the spine and impact the pineal gland. If you ever get a chance, look back in that book in the back, in the green book on the uh, back shelf. And there's something from the New York Times. In fact, you have it in your material from the New York Times. In fact, you do have it in your material. And it's from the New York Times. And it talks about how the energy must rise up the, uh, the spine. Yes, on page 64 of this material. And it's written by Dr. Alfred Lowy. It's in the New York Times. And it says, after traveling through nerves in the spinal cord, the signal reaches the pineal gland. OK? Now, that's, that's it. That's your crucifixion. Traveling, it must travel through the nerves in the spinal cord, but it's not going to go up there unless, uh, unless you send it up there. No. Yes? Yes. Very good. That's real good. Thank you. That's excellent. Um, what Mike was saying is prior to the crucifixion, Jesus was at the Mount of Olives. That's very, very good. I didn't think that. Oh, God. No, I, have to give him, I have to give him credit for that. Doggone it. Between him and Doppler, I can never think of these things myself. But that's, very, very, that's a very excellent point because the energy which rises up the spine to hit the hypoglossal where the olive is, is portrayed right there at the Mount of Olives. Very, very good. Oh, shut up. Yes. 
come up here. Come on. He hates this, you know, because he doesn't like to come up in front of it. <laughs> if you look in the back of the Bible, there's this map of Jerusalem. Yes. Where is it here? And if you hold it sideways, mm -hmm. here's the olives, here's the hippodrome, and oh, here's Golgotha. <laughs> Could that be the brain? There's a map in the back of the Bible right before the reference stuff. I'll take I'll tell them where it is, you don't mind. This Uncle Mike, Uncle Mike does the numerology. <laughs> no, but it's very true. On the very back, page 1028, right before the special there, is, uh, uh, there is, it says Mount of Olives, mm -hmm. and then you also see the Hippodrome, which is the place of the horse, which would be the Hippocampus, and then Golgotha. Very good. Now, would you please <laughs> just keep quiet? <laughs> yeah, Go back to your seat. <laughs> now, now, I appreciate I do appreciate that, and I, and I encourage you, whenever you have thoughts like that, please raise your hand. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get you embarrassed, yeah. But uh, that is real. That's, that's an excellent point, and we want to, you know, please uh, make that. Are we back with me here? No. no. You know, you know, Mike's down here showing everybody his map that he found, you know. That other point. But, uh, but please make this a part of, of the study here, and I had not thought of that, that prior to going to the crucifixion, the energy goes to the olive at the hypoglossal, which would be the incident at the Mount of Olives. Very good. Thank you very much, I'm and I mean that. Um, okay. Now, the, second, the other thing that we showed last week, which I think was important, is inasmuch as we have uh, gotten the entire uh, crucifixion um, to, to take place in the skull, we know we are very familiar with this scene, which we you know see all the time in in, in demonstration, and that is the two thieves. Well, now if we're going to place this in the skull, then what are the two thieves going to be? Okay, the two eyes. All right. So there's the two thieves right here, and uh, the we. These are the things that, and how many times have you said in your life, you know, I think my eyes are deceiving me. They deceive you by causing you to reach out for things that you shouldn't reach out for, and they deceive you by allowing people to show you what they say is the truth, but really isn't. And so the two thieves must be crucified, meaning the two eyes must be crucified, and then the center eye is the Christ. But what, uh, let me show you what makes this so significant. What makes this so significant is when we look at Supernova 1987A and we see the crucifixion. All right? So now we have the crucifixion, the two eyes, and the center eye, which is the Christ, looking down on the world today. All right? So then we have a real good legit. Listen, I did not say that the crucifixion happens in the skull. I didn't say that. The Bible did. I didn't say that this happens in Golgotha and Calvary and Testament. The Bible said that. So that the whole thing happens in the skull. So then it's very legitimate to say that the two thieves, there's one on the left side and one on the right side, are the eyes. And these eyes are the things that have to be closed so that we can see with the third eye, the single eye, the pineal gland, and then here it comes in the sky, and we have a picture of it. So we have a picture of the crucifixion in the skull in the form of supernova 1987A. So as the energy then moves to the skull and we meditate, we shut down the five senses, which are the five wounds. Then a crown of thorns is placed on Jesus' head, which is a symbol of the disdain that the system has for the higher consciousness. And they, they scourge him, which is a symbol of the disdain that the system has for the kundalini, which rises up the spine and so forth and so on. And at the point of the crucifixion, it says that they gambled for his garment, Matthew 27, 35. Now, let's think of something here. And we're getting very close to this point that I really want you to, to hang on to because I think it's, it's spectacularly awesome. They parted his garments. They gambled of his garments. Now, remember, there is no garment. There is no crucifixion. 
This is a myth. And the first thing that we have to do is get a book out and say, what is a myth? Because if you tell anybody up on the street that the story of Jesus' crucifixion is a myth, they'll say, oh, you're saying this didn't happen. Not at all. But it doesn't happen the way your literal story says it does. A myth is a symbolic story that has deep meanings of both a spiritual, bodily, and astronomical nature. It's a story about the universe, the cosmos. There wasn't a Medusa with snakes growing out of her head. That's not true. There was not a flying horse called Pegasus. That's not true. There was not a crucifixion. There was not a virgin birth. But these things all happen in the realm of the great, great cosmic universal life that we are part of. Yes, it does happen. But you have to understand it as a mature, grown person. Even the Bible itself says, when I was a child, I thought in childish ways. It's okay as a little kid to believe in Santa Claus. It's not okay when you reach your age to believe in Santa Claus. You have to understand things. And so they said they, they gambled over his garment. The crucifixion is in the skull, Mount Calvary, Golgotha. In the skull is an organ called Amon's horn. You have it in your stuff here. We found out that another name for Amon is Amen. And Jesus in Revelation 13, 14 is called the Amen. So he is in the skull where the crucifixion takes place. Right there. And his garment and stuff 16b, the hippocampus, which is a white eminence, eminence, which is the white horse that he comes back on, in your skull, the hippocampus is defined in page 16b of your stuff by Stedman's Medical Dictionary as the medial margin. And right in parentheses it says hem of the cortical, which is outer garment, mantle, which is garment. The hem of his garment is the hippocampus of your brain. And so what is it saying here? They're gambling over his garment. They're gambling with their very minds. They're gambling with their very own awareness, enlightenment. In other words, they are willing. They are willing to set aside, and, and for the sake of the system, they are willing to gamble away their life, their enlightenment, their salvation, their peace, their harmony by doing this. Now, this is we're going to get to the point which I think is awesome. And I, I want to share with you because if we have established, and it's up to you, if we have established that the crucifixion happens in the skull, if we have established that if the crucifixion happens in the skull, then the two eyes of the two thieves which are then crucified one side to the other. If that is the case, if we have established that, then Supernova 1987A we have established as the point of the crucifixion. And what is interesting about this, as you know, we have previously established that in your brain there's a straight line from the pineal gland to the fornix, and that in the sky there's a straight line from supernova 1987A to the fornax, which is the same furnace of Shadrach, but we won't go into that. It says, and I, let's read this because this is significant, okay? Uh, let's open to page 807. Right? On page 807, look at Matthew 27. And I, and I would like you to look at this because I, 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 don't, I don't think I'll, I may not tell you anything after this that is as significant as what I'm going to tell you today and what I'm going to give you to leave this building with. Okay? This is it. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. In other words, the crucifixion has taken place these days. And behold, the veil of the temple, that's the curtain of the temple, was rent. That means it's cut in two. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, that means they split, and the graves were opened, and bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves, and went into the holy city. Okay. So then we had the crucifixion, and the curtain was split. The curtain was cut. The earth did quake 
and the saints who were in the grave came out. <sighs> okay. You and I have studied here and reached the conclusion that this symbolically was telling us of a crucifixion that happens in the skull and a crucifixion that is portrayed by Supernova 1987A, which is the single eye in the sky. We followed this through the discovery of the planets and oh, everything that fit the picture and we went along coincidence after coincidence after coincidence to say this is no longer a coincidence. Last week, we arrived at the point of talking about Supernova 1987A as the crucifixion. Do you remember when I talked to you about 4555 and we said that 4555, which was the number of Mene in, in the story of Daniel, connected, we connected 4555 to Supernova and that was on April 5th, 4-5. And you remember that right after that, I came back, two days after that, I came back to you and I said something very strange has happened and I had you come up and look at it, that my job at the cable company is to get all of their towers registered that are over 200 feet for the company. And that one of the engineers came to me and said, you were in charge of the cable company in Brick Township there for 22 years and he said, would you take a look at their registration? And I looked at it, the tower registration, and I looked at the latitude and it was 45.55. Remember that? I showed it to you. Okay. In the last week, I told you that Supernova 1987A was the crucifixion and the skull. And we've gone over that again today. And then we read that after the crucifixion, when he had yielded the temple, curtain was cut in two. Okay, what I'm going to give you is from Paul Resser, R-E-C-E-R, -E the Associated Press, San Diego, California. Astronomers crack the curtain of dust. San Diego, astronomers for the first time have cracked the curtain of interstellar dust known as the zone of avoidance that blocks Earth's view of a fourth of the universe. <coughs> the universal curtain has been torn in two. What they found, said Patricia Henning of the University of Mexico, were 102 previously unknown galaxies. And a hint of clusters of galaxies forming an immense S-shaped structure beyond the Milky Way. We looked at thousands upon thousands looking for the signature of the galaxies. In a report at the National Meeting of the American Astronomical Society, Australian, American, European astronomers penetrated the cloud in the center of the Milky Way. The solar system, get this, is in one arm of the spiral structure of the Milky Way. Henning said the team will continue to search for hidden galaxies and expects by late next year to have found more than 2,000 star clusters never before detected. The zone of avoidance is not empty, but seems to contain a population of galaxies filled with billions of stars. Last week, we arrived at the point of understanding that supernova was and is the crucifixion. This week I'm giving you, from the Associated Press, not from any New Age book, from the Associated Press, documentation that the curtain that separated us from a fourth. Now I want to tell you something. Do you remember when we talked about the fourth and the eye? And you remember in the story of Shadrach, when they looked in the furnace, the fourth man appeared? And you remember we said that the energy going from the pineal to fornax, which is the furnace, and I said I wouldn't be surprised to see the fourth circle. <coughs> and it says here that they cracked the curtain that blocks Earth's view of the fourth of the universe. 
And um, so now we have to say that we had the movement of the energy of the discovery of the planets from Virgo to Leo, from Didier Quilios in Switzerland to Geoffrey Morrissey in San Francisco and the scientists discovering the planets. And Hubble showed us the single eye. And then we said, what could possibly happen next? And we read in the Bible that the next feature would be, if that was the crucifixion, that the temple curtain would tear. And we see in headlines from the Associated Press that the curtain of the universe has been torn. And what comes next are, according to the Bible, the earthquakes. And then the saints come out of the graves. Well, inasmuch as you understand that this is all symbolism, you say, what could that possibly mean? Let me tell you what it means. And this is where you can totally disdain what I'm saying because I, I can't offer this as proof except to say to you that think of it as you would. <sighs> Understanding quantum, you realize that when a photon splits or an electron splits, the two parts go off into different directions. They can be separated by light years, galaxies, distances, but they're always one even though they're apart. If this one that's in 20 million galaxies apart hits a wall, this one that's 20 billion galaxies away will stop. Why? Because it's the same person. When a person dies, the split occurs. Actually, that's not true. The split has always occurred. <coughs> you are sitting here and there is a twin of yours here in a place called 4555. You know, when I was doing this last night, a Muslim lady came up to me and she said, I'm going to send you something from the Koran. I said, well, I'd love to have that. She said, well, you will particularly love to have this. She says, because in the Koran, God says, everything I make is a twin. So there are those who have gone on from your life, family, whomever, who have reincarnated into bodies here to go on with their life and different adventures on the earth. But there is the other part <coughs> who have always been at 4555 as you were at 4555. And you will begin to see those whom we have called light beings, and you will sit with your mouth open and say, it's you. You will recognize the return of those whom you love. It's very difficult with a primitive brain that we have to understand these things. I can tell you that this is the most exciting and joyous time that you could even conceive of being alive. We have done everything possible using the very Bible, using the ancient documents, to document the fact that indeed this skull crucifixion is the crucifixion that takes place in all of us. And then we have seen this tremendous thing happen in the sky and we are able to attribute to that. And then following the scriptures, it tells us that the next event would be the uh, tearing of the curtain. And then we have this for me to give to you about the tearing of the curtain. But you see, the curtain is not only in the sky which has been torn and now they see a fourth more. But let me tell you something, there's a curtain inside of you. There is a dura mater, which is the outer covering of your brain. There is a pia mater, which is the most sensitive place. The pia mater of your brain is the residence of Holy Mother. Your mother inside is waiting to take you in her arms. 
and she has a beautiful blue, but I won't tell you that. But she's waiting to take you in her arms, and <laughs> only when the curtain is cut, and between the dura mater, or the outer hard covering of your brain, and the pia mater, which is the most sensitive inner part of you, there is something called arachnoid, which is the web, or the curtain, or the veil. And that will split in two at the point of your crucifixion now. That is why it is so important to do your meditation and to do it solemnly and to do it with great energy and to do it with great devotion because this is the time. Even in our meditations now, we attach a part where you can talk to them. The, the beings of light and beings whom you know are closer than your breath listening and ready now to lean down to you and, and to help you and to touch you and to make things right. You can, you can talk about just normal everyday things with them now. What can I do? I mean, if I, if, if I last week and I tell you that, you know, the, the crucifixion, and now it says in the Bible that the curtain is torn, and here it says the astronomers crack the curtain and they see a fourth of the universe that they didn't see before. Is it all a coincidence? Is 45, 55? I mean, were you in your wildest dreams, could you, in your wildest dreams, that I am the one talking about 45, 55, and I show you this official government document that says I was sitting there for 22 years, the only one in the country that has the latitude of 45, 55. Is that a coincidence to you? And this? Um, when, when you look at the, at the words that they use for the area, it's called the zone of avoidance, and that's what we avoid when we don't Exactly. Meditate. It is exactly. And, and, and what you're like saying... And no one can hear her better. Like yeah, better. okay, go ahead. I, I hear her so much that I... <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when the astronomers describe it as the zone of avoidance, that's the area that we avoid when we don't meditate. That's right. And, and you know the interesting thing with what you're saying, you remember when we showed the tape here the other couple of weeks ago, the videotape about the, uh, on ABC about the uh, scientists? What did they say they were going to be doing? They were developing new uh, things to go on Hubble that would enable them to pierce the unseen part of the universe. In other words, what they are doing physically to pierce the unseen part of the universe is exactly what you do in your meditation to pierce the unseen part of the brain, of the mind. That's really, really sensational stuff. So I want you to make a part, make this a part, number 101 of your material, and think about it. Think about it now. Think about why, hey, you know, it's time to stop fooling with this. This isn't a religious thing. It's no God. This is a, this is a scientific fact. This is an astronomical thing that is happening here, all right? And well, how could this possibly be in a Bible? We've missed we've misused this into a, some kind of a religious thing which has destroyed it. These things were written by people thousands of years ago, okay? These things were written by people thousands of years ago who had known that this had happened previously and were writing all of these things. In other words, every bit of this Bible is a symbolic story written down to foretell the astronomical events that were going to take place on the planet Earth. And they're right on schedule. And you know, you don't have to be a, a what was it, Nostradamus or anything to know. You, you, I can get you an astronomer to tell you what minute and second Halley's Comet's going to pass over Fork and River. He won't tell you approximately, he'll tell you what day, what time, what second. And the people who wrote this thousands of years ago were simply laying in symbolic form these truths for you to discover when you had evolved to a point where you could understand them. Now you can. Why can you? Because of science, because of Hubble, because of NASA, because of the education that you have. You're at a point now where you can understand these things. People couldn't understand. And, and now you, can you see where you have to separate from this lunacy, which bases itself, everything that these people are predicting or hoping for is that Jesus was crucified, that God had to have blood flowing all over the place in order to act out a simple act of forgiveness, and now they're waiting for God to drop atomic bombs all over the place to prove how much he loves them. And this is, their, this is it. And so you leave that type of a thing. 
and you, and you come out into this field of billions of stars and you look up and you look up with, with the scientists of the world and maybe they don't understand where you're coming from, but that's fine. But you look up and you say to God, hey, I'm not a, I'm not a Christian. No, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not a Hindu. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm not New Age. I'm not No Age. I said, God, whatever the heck you are, it's just you and me, pal. Let's go. Wow. Let's fly. I don't need anybody looking over my shoulders. Oh, you shouldn't think like that. Oh, you can't think like that. I don't, you don't need that. Because it comes from within you. And they don't know the ways of the great wonders of the universe. They don't know. So they can't tell you how to think or what to think of. And so now the, the temple veil has been split. And as it has been split in the sky, I expect that within you it will be split as well. And as they have seen a fourth more, you will see a fourth more. And as they have seen billions of new things, you will understand billions of new things. And then you can be on this beautiful line with the coming light from Nova as we approach. I don't know. Did they say 2000? I don't know. It's only 1998 and it's coming hot and heavy. The Giza Plateau is set up the same way, just like you said. Uh huh. Well, we're talking about that. John's back there talking about, I'm, I'm just repeating here. Go ahead, keep talking. John's talking about, he, he visited um, uh, Egypt and went and... Uh, it's all uh, set up the same way, as above, below. I said John, uh, John and Mariola, who uh, went and visited Egypt, and they saw the same things that we're talking about here. That's interesting. That's what they sphinxes, so that could have been the twins. Uh-huh. Because possibly there was another sphinx on the other side of the causeway. Uh-huh. Right. John is talk he's talking about the possibility that there could have been two sphinxes. I think there's some more to be written there. As, uh, yeah. There's a lot more to be written there as they get down and uh, as they start to put these. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anyhow, uh, I don't know what else I could do this week to get you excited. I think that, that um, if this doesn't do it for you, then you're a little bit uh, oblivious to, to what's happening. But please, please, please never use this to frighten, especially anybody. Never use this as threats on children or anybody. This is not frightening. This is not a threat. This is the coming power of what you've called God to heal, to make right, to lift those who have been oppressed, to sanctify and heal all of those things which have hurt, and to, and, and, and to just steer this great living uh, entity which is called humanity and animal into a whole new direction of oneness and, and cooperation. On the other hand, at the same time, as these gates start to spring open and as this energy starts to come down, you hear about these quakes of the earth, you're going to see a lot of confusion and you're seeing it already start now in, in the realms of, of government and in business and so forth. A lot of confusion and a lot of breakdown and a lot of shattering and a lot of falling down. But I'll tell you something. If there's a piece of dirt in your floor, that piece of dirt does not like being swept out. But in order for you to make your room clean, it's got to go. And much of this, which has hurt and oppressed so many millions of people, when I look, and I go sometimes, you know, Joe and I have been to the Bahamas. I don't know if I could ever go again. We've been to Acapulco. And these things, and I see all the beautiful hotels and all the wonders, and then you walk two blocks in and see the absolute wretched poverty of people who sleep under cardboard. That stinks. And that type of dirt must be swept away so those people can stand up and share in the wonders of this wonderful universe. So as we will look up at this great thing and say the crucifixion has taken place, the veil has been rent, even so, come, come, and let us all enjoy this together. Amen. Thank you very much. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Okay, well, <coughs> welcome again, and uh, continuing on the amazing journey that all of us are on. Um, you know, when you, when you consider the fact that basically you're in the same realm as if you were in a spaceship, starship Earth is what you're on, you're traveling at 40,000 miles an hour through all kinds of interesting and exciting things whizzing by in all directions. 
and, and yet most people walking around out there pay no attention, uh, which is sad because there comes a time in the evolution of the planet and the evolution of the universe when things suddenly impact and change radically the environment and change even the social structure and the um, electrical patterns that are inherent in the human brain and in, in all brains actually, all living things and that's what, this what's happening now. And so what we've been looking at is documents that were written thousands of years ago and somehow found their way into all of our cultures. I mean, Muslims, they have the Koran and the, you know, they have the sutras of, of Buddha and the Vedas of Krishna and all of these things. And of course we have the Bible and the Western culture. And then, yet the stories inherent in these things are so silly that you know, they defy logic totally. But yet, why, why are they so important? You know, what, how, who did them, who put them together? Why are they so much a part of the cultures? And yet, so terribly misunderstood. But it doesn't, as we've seen, take a whole lot to get behind the word and realize that there was indeed an advanced civilization from another dimension, another planet, and another place, which I believe was 4555, which is, pictured here on the wall, who came to this earth and left these writings in deep symbols. And so then you would say, well, why didn't they just flat out tell everybody uh, what was going on and why put it in symbols? Which would be akin to you taking a child to uh, you know, kindergarten or the first grade and start teaching trigonometry or algebra. It's the, they haven't reached the point where they can understand that yet. But um, if you come around when they reach the eighth grade and start teaching algebra, fine, you, you, you can do it. So all of these things relate here. But not only is it interesting when you begin to find out what was being written about, but it's very interesting when you start saying to yourself, well, then who were these people that came here and wrote these things, and how did they get here? And of course, for so many years, we've been consumed in the fact that, well, they had to take spaceships, which would take them so many light years and, you know, uh, never get here, never get back, until we found in December when in Innsbruck, Austria, they teleported photons and showed us that indeed it is feasible and technologically possible, according to Dr. Zellinger, to teleport a human being from one galaxy to another instantly. Forget the speed of light. You just, you're here, you're there, and that's the end of that. So, uh, you know, we start to realize how much we don't know when we look at these things, not only as we start to develop new information and start to learn of things. But last week, we looked together at one of the most awesome things that has taken place in our studies as, as children, uh, as uh, people, you know, growing up in, in religious circles. We provided information to you that was quite convincing to suggest that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is a myth of natural power that takes place within the human body and within the universe. That's a very tough statement to make when, you know, you have people running around upstairs, you know, going, you know, into church and ringing bells and singing hymns from the, from the Middle Ages. And yet, it's so beautiful because once you realize it's a myth, then you can say, oh, now I know there is, there's something true behind this because a myth is a wild story written in symbols that has as it, at its root deep truths about the human body and about the universe and about science and spirit. That's what a myth is. It's not just, it's not a crazy story that doesn't mean anything. It's a crazy story, yes. But once you get past the craziness and once you get past the illogical rapport in these words, you find something that is tremendously real having to do with the cosmos and your brain. That's what happened. You remember when we talked about 4555, and we spent two years here talking about 4555 and, and, this, and this galaxy, and then I was able to connect 4555 to the supernova, which interestingly we did on April 5th, which was 45, but then right after that, what happened? Right after that, in my job, in fact, I have to go away this week to Alabama for, for that job, but in, in my job, one of the things I, I do for this Comcast cable is I check all of their towers to make sure that they're properly registered with the government. 
And the one, when I was managing the cable system up in Brick Township for 22 years, the tower there, uh, when we went to register and we'll look at its um, latitude and longitude and all of these things, they showed it to me. And there, the latitude on that tower was 4555, 4555, which is the only one. Yeah. This is a picture of 4555. It's a galaxy. So why is 4555 such a big deal? Because according to the Coptics of 2,000 years ago in Egypt, they said, hold this number close to you, 4555. And then, of course, in the book of Daniel, when the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had come out of the furnace, there was this word scrawled across the wall by a hand that had no arm on it. You want to talk about a myth. <laughs> Mene, mene, which means number. But when you look at the, in Jewish and Hebrew and in Greek, and you look, each letter has a numerical value. And the value of M is 40, E is 5, N is 50, E is 5. And there it was again, 45, 55. So we were able to develop circumstantial evidence. And basically, that's what you get when you, when you go into these things. You get circumstantial evidence. I think that the fact that I was working on 4555 for all these years and you were coming in here and we were working at it together and we saw it in the Bible and saw it in the Coptics and then lo and behold finds that I was sitting there at that latitude in Brick Township for 22 years at 4555 becomes a little more than a coincidence. Okay. And now we point out supernova 1987A as the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And we pointed out that these are the two eyes because the entire process takes place in the skull. We learn this from all of the scriptures. Golgotha means skull. Calvary means skull. He's the testator means skull. Everything happens in the skull. So then we say, well, the, in the skull, that which deceives us and that which steals life from us are the things that we see. So, okay, then the two eyes would be the uh, thieves and the single, the center eye, the pineal gland would be the Christ. That makes sense. And that, that you know, that's, that would be enough, maybe. But that's nothing because what we're predicating this on is the appearance of the supernova. I don't know how many of you people have seen this. But this is the supernova, 1987A, which is the single, and there you see the two eyes and the single eye in the center. This was taken by Hubble. Okay? This was taken by Hubble. It was on the front page of National Geographic. And I would even dare to say most New Age people who dabble in this stuff haven't even seen this thing. What's the sense of going to all these meetings? What's the sense of reading all these books if what's happening, the big stuff is happening in the sky now and nobody's paying attention to it? Who cares what somebody said 10,000 years ago anymore? The important thing is what's happening now. And so you look at this and then you say, gosh, now I know what the crucifixion is. The crucifixion actually is what happens inside of the human skull in meditation. But more than that now, not only does the human skull meditate, but now the cosmos is in meditation and the pineal gland of the cosmos has appeared. And the crucifixion of the cosmos is happening. So you say, all right, that's what I'm saying happened. That's what I'm saying this was about. I'm saying that supernova 1987A is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So it's all a myth. I know it's difficult, but what I'm telling you is never was a man named Jesus Christ. That's what makes it so wonderful. Because by knowing there wasn't a man named Jesus Christ, you realize there is a Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the Son. That's what the word means. If you take the numerical value of the Greek letters J-E-S-U-S, -S, it comes down to 888, which in Greek is the mythical son. How can you read things written by the Greeks 2,000 years ago and take them literally? You can't. They didn't write literally. They were great mythologists. They were great scientists. They were trying to tell us something. And the word Christ means the anointed. The sun anointing, the solar plexus energy and meditation rises to the brain. On its way to the brain, it hits something at the hypoglossal nerve called the olivera body, the olive. You get anointed with olive oil as it runs through the oil of the, of the spinal canal. It hit, impacts the brain. That's why Jesus went to the Mount of Olives before he went to the cross. This is real stuff. 
But what have we done with it? God can't forgive you for going to Atlantic City, so we had to nail this guy up and have blood all over the place. <laughs> and once he sees the blood flow, then he says, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, now I'm happy. What kind of stuff is he? A human.